This is CBC Here and Now. It comes with the trade, like any job, whether it's like this or anything out in the cold or whatever, you just got to keep balance through it. Boy, it's cold enough to skin you out here today. The wind's enough to cut you in half. But that's it, we got a job to do, hey boy. As long as you dress for the weather, you should have no problem. No problem for some, but this cold snap is leaving most of the province with an icy feeling. Most of us can just step inside to get warm, but who's watching out for the pets that are being left outside? Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Peter Cowan, and that is our top story tonight. The extreme cold that is holding Newfoundland firmly in its grip. It's been nearly two full days of numbing winter temperatures, the likes of which haven't been seen in several years. And that cold has left animal protection groups flooded with calls for help. Here now, Cease Hare has that story tonight. Busy because it's been so cold, not fit for a dog, and when it's like this, they need an extra layer of protection. It can be cold outside. Times change. There was a time when the family dog lived outside. It wasn't walked, but today's pet has extra protection when it goes out. Laws are in place protecting dogs that live outdoors. We had yesterday approximately between 25 and 30 calls, and that's strictly beagles. Sandra Whiteo is with the rescue group Beagle Paws, and she says people forget that when it's freezing out, it's also freezing out for dogs. During this extremely frigid weather, the complaints that poured into her organization were passed along to police, humane services, or local animal control officers. In some cases, owners were told to take their dogs inside. And as the temperatures dropped, the province made a public plea, reminding people to keep cats and dogs inside or give them access to an insulated doghouse. Whiteho says many people have no idea what's required for a legal dog shelter. Needs a hallway, needs to be not sitting directly on the ground, a uh, flap on the door and a separate dry uh, sleeping area with bedding, straw, blankets, you know, whatever. Whiteho says in her idea of a perfect world, it would be illegal for dogs to be penned to live outside. And outside of that, she wants, at the very least, a law making it illegal to keep pets out when the temperature hits the freezing point of water. Hopefully, you know, something's in place before this happens again next year, you know. I, I would like them to see a limit set, you know. Anything below zero, like, you're in the house. The police in this province were very busy, too. Both the RNC and the RCMP say there was a big spike in the number of calls of pets being left outside in the bitter cold. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. Well, as you just heard and clearly noticed over the past couple of days, temperatures have been quite cold. And here's a look at what we saw uh, this morning as our overnight low. So minus 16 in St. John's, minus 24 in Badger. And then uh, minus 37 was the morning temperature for Lab City this morning. Now, you did just see these numbers uh, from Cease's story. But uh, just to put that into context, St. John's has been sitting at a wind chill of minus 40 or rather minus 20. 25 for more than 29 consecutive hours. So definitely seen that uh, cold snap. Now the warning has uh, since ended for most of the province. Still have an extreme cold warning for the northern peninsula, but this is for Friday morning in, or rather Friday night into uh, Saturday morning. Even though temperatures are going to be quite cold as uh, you head out the door again tomorrow morning, sitting in the minus teens across the board, those winds will be uh, much better, so we won't see those wind chills quite as cold. But into the afternoon tomorrow, we're going to hang on to these cool temperatures. Uh, not really moving much from what we saw today, maybe a couple of degrees for the Avalon and down along the southern uh, part of the island. But other than that, temperatures look quite cold again tomorrow. Not much happening, maybe a few flurries. I'll have all those details coming up. Carolyn? Thanks, Ashley. Well, Newfoundland and Labrador has a problem with some prescription medications. We use too much too often, but there is work being done to try to fix that. Here and now's Katie Breen reports. When it comes to antibiotics, pharmacies in the province dispense a lot. 
Newfoundland and Labrador uses the most antibiotics in the country by a long shot. Prescriptions have actually increased in the last five years, and that's problematic for a few reasons. It's costly, good bacteria gets harmed, and antibiotics stop working. If we're overprescribing them, then that can cause resistance to build up, and we already know that, especially in certain parts of the world, there are bacteria that are no longer responding to some of our more common antibiotics. Prescribers need to look at whether drugs are needed and then cut back on dosage and duration. An app like this could help with that. It says Eastern Health because these recommendations are specific to Eastern Health. Once a diagnosis is made, the prescriber can go in and fill out a checklist. Then out pops a proposed treatment plan. And here we have two drugs that we suggest physicians should use. Spectrum is on a free trial now. It was introduced in the province two weeks ago. Daily hopes it picks up traction. We know that uh, physicians learn to use antibiotics at one point during their training, and they tend to use the same pattern of drug usage throughout their career. And unfortunately, in some cases, what they learned initially was overkill. They didn't need to use such broad spectrum, such powerful antibiotics, such long durations. The app focuses on antibiotics, but antibiotics aren't our province's only problem. We also take some of the most reflux medications, sleeping pills and painkillers in the country, which is why government has switched some funding to focus on deprescribing those medications. And if that works, that's great. If that doesn't work, we'll look at something else. When it comes to prescription medications, the health minister acknowledges that our province is out of whack. And he says the health department is willing to try new technologies to help cut back. One example, an electronic prescription service that Haggy says could be in place province-wide sometime this year. Katie Breen, CBC News, St. John's. Coming up, we'll hear from Chilean and Canadian players about the first ever World Cup qualifier held here in Newfoundland and Labrador. While well, a man once found not guilty of murdering a co-worker was back in Supreme Court today. Ray Stacy pleaded guilty to assaulting his wife and carjacking two vehicles last May. This morning, he was sentenced to a total of 42 months for that crime spree. The Crown wanted a longer sentence, but the judge noted in his decision that Stacy does not have a record of violent crimes. Though he has been accused of that in the past, Stacy was found not guilty in 2016 of murdering a co-worker, Clifford Comerford. Some tense moments as members of Comerford's family were in court today. Hey boy, you're the dirtbag. Have, have fun, have fun, have fun. Have fun. Yeah, he, he, he has he, so he, much remor uh, remorse, right? Yeah. Murderers gets away with murderers. Well, after extra credit for his time already spent in custody, Stacy has about 27 months left to serve. Well, was Al Potter's confession caught on tape? The jury at the first degree murder trial heard a wiretap recording today of Potter explaining how he stabbed a man three years earlier. Potter's fictitious former boss also took the stand for a second day to give a play by play of the hours leading up to Potter's 2016 arrest. Ariana Kelland is live with more tonight. So Ariana, what can you tell us? Well, Carolyn, for two days straight, the court has listened to hours of conversation, chit chat, banter, laughter and talk of getting to business as debt collectors. But then finally this afternoon, the jury heard what appears to be a confession. Now, let me set the scene for you. After burying what Potter believes was a dead body, he and his new boss, an undercover cop, drive to McDonald's. Throughout the day, Potter confides in the officer that he was arrested, then released three years earlier for the murder of Dale Porter. But the cop pushes for more. There's some reluctance from Potter, some silence, and he denies there are any loose ends that need tying up. But then he speaks up. Potter says that the knife used in the stabbing was thrown into the ocean, that his clothing was burned, and it rained that night, washing away evidence. When pushed further, Potter says he was protecting a friend of his, that Dale Porter disrespected the club, made indecent proposals to his friend's lady, and spit on the colors. The officer says Potter even demonstrated how he stabbed Dale Porter, punching his rather bunching his right fist and pushing it into the officer's chest, spinning him around and doing it to his back. 
Now, Potter also assured the officer that this was nothing to worry about, that it was three years ago and that he wasn't arrested for it yet. But that conversation and a subsequent conversation the next day would lead to Potter's arrest and to where we are today. Now, the Crown will soon be wrapping its case. Then we'll find out who the defense will be calling as a witness, and that could be Al Potter himself. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Arianna Kelland. Well, a 51-year-old man from Happy Valley Goose Bay has been arrested and charged with possession of child pornography. Last September, the RCMP RNC Integrated Internet Child Exploitation Unit received a complaint regarding the transmission of child porn. Yesterday, police executed a search warrant at a residence in the town where child pornography was found. The homeowner, Valence Oliver, was arrested and set to face charges in court today. Police say the investigation is ongoing. Well, the price of gas is seeing its biggest jump of 2019 in the province. Starting today, a liter is about four and a half cents more expensive than it was yesterday. A liter of self-serve on the Avalon Peninsula will not exceed a dollar 19. It's the third consecutive week that gas prices have increased. Well, his colleagues call it the Nobel Prize of Dermatology. Dr. Wayne Gulliver of St. John's was awarded the Dr. Albert Neiser Lecture Award at a conference in Warsaw, Poland earlier this month. The prize is named after a German dermatologist best known for his work with leprosy and sexually transmitted diseases. Gulliver is the 15th person and first Canadian to receive the honor. He was recognized for his research on HS, a painful long-term skin condition that has no known cure. Gulliver says there's a high prevalence of HS in this province. Testimony about the audit presented at the Muskrat Falls inquiry this week has come to an end. For four days, a Grant Thornton auditor has presented and defended the findings of the audit to all of the lawyers in the room. And our Jacob Barker was there listening to it all. Well, it's been like deja vu every day here at the Muskrat Falls inquiry as Grant Thornton's Scott Schaefer has been on the stand fielding questions about his 140 page audit looking at the construction phase of the Muskrat Falls project. There were all sorts of insight into the post sanctioning phase of the project, a glimpse at the inner workings of Nalcor as it picked its contractors and watched the price of the project rise. Nalcor knew with the early bids for the project in that it was already $600 million over its estimates, but there was no evidence the auditor found that showed the company communicated that on to the government of the day. There's no reference to government ever being communicated anything with respect to these provisions. As it relates to um, the SNC situation and to the QRAs that Wesney performed, that's correct as far as I, I remember. The public were, ne were never informed of that situation, and as far as we can determine, uh, we don't know if the board of directors were informed, and we don't know when and if the government was informed. Evidence as well about the stripping of SNC Lavalin from many of its responsibilities. It was initially chosen to manage the construction and design of the project. The audit gave rise to questions about the people Nalcor chose for their core management team in their place. Paul Harrington, how much hydroelectric uh, uh, experience did Mr. Harrington have before he undertook work on the Muskrat Falls project? None. Same question for Jason Kane. None. So it's not like we removed s and Avalon. We kept the best parts, which was the engineering and some of the key construction management people who performed extremely well for us. And Staldi, whose, quote, poor performance came into focus at the inquiry, had its chance to question the auditor today as well. It had nothing to do whether Astaldi was at fault or any or blame, was it? When I say poor performance, or what I'm comparing is what was the actual productivity on the uh, direct labor hours per cubic meter that was actually uh, that actually occurred versus what was in the bid. Just down the road from here, the project stands about 96 percent complete. The picture we're getting at the inquiry is just a glimpse at the shaky road that got us to this point. And the hope is that as this inquiry motors on, that picture becomes more and more clear. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay.
Well, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is expected to land in St. John's tonight, and we know a little more about what he plans to do while he's here. Tomorrow, the Prime Minister will be speaking with supporters and donors at a fundraising event at the Alt Hotel on Water Street. He's also scheduled to make remarks and take questions from the media at noon. After that, he plans to meet with Premier Dwight Ball. However, there has been no indication Trudeau plans to make any major announcements while he's here. Well, there's a special treat in store for sports fans in this province. Canada's national basketball team is in St. John's right now. Yes, and they're getting ready to play at mile one. Here now is Mark Quinn is there right now. So, uh, Mark, what's happening? Well, the excitement is building. People are starting to filter in. Of course, this is the very first time there's been a national team, two national teams, playing here in a World Cup qualifier for basketball. Tonight, the uh, Canadian team is playing Chile. And, uh, you know, they're already actually qualified for the World Cup. But that doesn't mean they're not taking this game really seriously. Um, I'll have more about this later on in the show. But first, we've got an item that uh, CBC's Jeremy Eaton did when he spoke with the Canadian team and asked them how important these games are to them. They're huge. They have an um, impact in terms of qualification in the world championships and seeding and stuff like that. So um, it's important to go out and play well and, and, and to win. It's dope. I, I'm, I've heard a lot of great things about the St. John's community, especially with the edge and their, and their, uh, their involvement with their team. And I just... Uh, I'm excited to be out here. It's the first time I've been here. I've been um, able to experience some of the different things out here and the food. Uh, so I, I thought it's, so far it's been really good and I'm excited to be here. With FIBA changing the format recently in the last couple of years, we've had more opportunities to play at home. So, you know, we've been in Victoria, we've been in Ottawa, we've been in Montreal, we've been in Toronto, now we're, be now we're here. So uh, this is very rare. I mean, we have not played a ton of games on home soil so any chance we get uh, our guys are very very appreciative and uh, take it pretty seriously. Certainly Melvin Ejim who you spoke to is, uh, is you know someone who's playing at a really high level you know uh, was Big 12 player of the year at Iowa State and he's had a great career in Europe. Kyle Wiltshire won a national championship at Kentucky and you know uh, is playing at a very very high level in Europe now and Joel Anthony won an NBA championship in Miami with a teammate of LeBron James and you know he's been through all of that so We've got some great stories of, of guys who are playing at a very high level uh, internationally, and then we have some great stories of guys who have played locally here in U Sport. So we've got a lot of good Canadian stories, and we've got a, a lot of great international stories, and we've got some really good NBA stories as well. You know what? Our teams continue to just get stronger. Or the depth of our talent continues to improve. Uh, this is a special group. The, the Windows group that's gone through this last uh, two years has had 36 different players, uh, but all of them committed, uh, selfless, willing to make a sacrifice for their country. And we brought a pretty strong roster here to St. John, so it's going to be a it's going to be a nice uh, opportunity for our fans to see Canadian basketball at its best. It's extremely important because uh, it's not just uh, it's Canada basketball. It's important to to spread the game all over the country, to experience uh, different places, and to bring the game to different cities that might not ne necessarily. Uh, normally have access to them. So I think the more that we get to do this, it's, it's going to be important for the growth of Canada basketball and important for guys who haven't been able to go out to these different places and interact with all these different communities to have that opportunity to do it. What a great opportunity for us to be able to see some pretty high-level basketball. And mm -hmm. I guess if you see some really tall people in downtown St. John's <laughs> over the next couple of days, you'll know what they're doing here. You'll know why for sure. And uh, Mark Quinn, of course, will be back a little bit later on in the show. He'll be speaking with uh, a member of the Chilean team. Kids as young as like grade four or grade three are getting cell phones. So I started thinking like if I was a grade four and I got a cell phone, I would probably encounter a lot of issues. Exactly what those issues are is up next. We'll tell you about a digital citizenship lesson for some Corner Brook students. They're learning it this week.
This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. 5,000 kilometers of groomed trails are waiting to be explored. Embrace winter today. It's been a bit chilly out there, especially by St. John's standards. You know, the temperatures over the last couple of days, not anything the townies are really used to having, no. but at least it was sunny. <laughs> it was. It was sunny, and uh, actually our CBC videographer, Bruce Tilly, took a little jaunt around town this afternoon and came across a few covered faces, people who were out working in the cold, and he really didn't have far to go to find them. <laughs> no, he certainly didn't. Take a look. The wind's enough to cut you in half. But that's it, we got a job to do, hey boy. Yeah, nothing really slows us down. <laughs> well, we're trying to get out of it as fast as we can, get it done and get back into warm. I'd rather be inside with a hot cup of coffee, but we got some work to do. Florida sounds pretty good. Yeah, I changed my answer back to Florida. <laughs> I'd rather be there any day. My name is Grant Pittman, a surveyor here in St. John's. Uh, working in the cold the last few days. I've dressed for the occasion, but as long as you're dressed right, it's not too bad. Cover up your skin. You see here with the vanilla clava, keep it up around your, your cheeks. Shouldn't have to worry about any frostbite. Uh, it can be ups and downs, but you know, if you keep pushing and don't give up and keep your head up, you'll get pretty rewarding, you know? Some people are friendly, some people are not, but it comes with the trade, like any job. Whether it's like this or anything out in the cold or whatever, you just gotta keep balance or it's good and bad everywhere, but you can't let that determine what your outcome can be. Always look to the future, keep going to the head, keep the peace, and just do the best you can. Amen, thank you, sir. Great. Oh, wow. <laughs> Words to live by. Certainly mm -hmm. some positive attitudes there. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I guess you, you all have to take it in stride. And Newfoundlanders are always good and Labradorians at looking at the positive side of things. So that's why, like, oh, look, it was sunny out today. There we go. Something yeah. good to grab onto. <laughs> we'll just ignore the wind chill. It was sunny. You were out in the cold today, too. Yeah. A little bit yeah. earlier. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, today wasn't as bad when I was out there today. And, yes, it was more sunny. It's amazing what that sun does. About three to five degrees warmer, it felt like anyway. And then less wind, too. So uh, taking a look at the temperatures right now, you can see it is a little bit warmer. Minus 11 in St. John's. Minus uh, 12 in Gander. We're seeing similar temperatures along the west coast as well. Minus 14 in Cornerbrook. And up through Labrador, similar temperatures as well, sitting in the minus teens. But uh, factor in that wind chill like we've been talking about. I'm sounding like a broken record, but these are the wind chills uh, for today in the minus 20 area or minus 20 range. And that's because the winds have uh, died down. But we do have that ex uh, extreme cold warning has ended for most of the province, but still around for the northern peninsula. And that's because we're going to see uh, those wind chills dip again, but for Friday night into Saturday morning. So Taking a look at those winds, as I mentioned, you can see they've died down quite significantly, gusting around 40 kilometers per hour. And as we head through the night tonight, even though those temperatures are going to dip down, we are going to see uh, some wind chills. Not quite as cold by the time tomorrow morning rolls around, but minus 22 it'll feel like for St. John's, minus, uh, potentially minus 29 for Gander. And then up through Labrador, though, another cold night, uh, feeling closer to minus 42 with that wind chill. And then into the afternoon, temperatures are going to rise and the wind chills won't be nearly as bad. So back down to about the minus 20s. It's the overnight, as I mentioned, up through the northern peninsula where that wind chill warning, uh, or rather extreme cold warning, will be in effect. So taking a look at the satellite radar, the good news also is the fact that the uh, snow squalls have let up a little bit. We are starting to see some snow down through the southwestern portion of uh, the province, but as we head through the night, things should uh, generally taper off as those winds ease. Here are your overnight lows, minus 11 for Port of Basque. Along the northeast coast and the south coast, we could see that potential for a few flurries again tonight, but uh, generally sitting around minus 13 for St. John's, minus 20 for Grand Falls, Windsor, with those northwest winds at gusting upwards of about 40 kilometers per hour. And then up through Labrador, another cold, calm night. Again, thanks to that ridge of high pressure, minus 29 is your overnight low for Lab City, and quite right sitting at minus 23 tonight. Now, looking ahead, 
it has been very quiet and will continue to be so tomorrow. We might see the potential for a few squalls or onshore flurries along the west coast. Otherwise, another day of mixed of sudden cloud with again onshore flurries possible for the northeast coast and then down through the Beeren Peninsula. Otherwise, Labrador, enjoy another sunny but cold day through the afternoon tomorrow. And as I mentioned, those temperatures are going to be a little bit warmer as well, so it won't feel so bad into the minus single digits for most of the Avalon and eastern Newfoundland. Uh, northwest winds near about 50 kilometers per hour tomorrow. As you head a little bit further west, we're going to start to get into some cooler air. So minus 10 for Grand Falls, Windsor. Otherwise, again, looking at those minus single digits along with that potential for sun and cloud and a, a chance of flurries as well. Some uh, winds will shift to the west for uh, the west coast. So north or rather west winds upwards of about 40 kilometers per hour. Those temperatures in the minus single digits again with uh, potential to see some squalls. So definitely keep that in mind. Plenty of sunshine up through the northern peninsula. And then same thing up through Labrador with temperatures sitting quite similar to what we saw today. So let's look at your forecast. I'll, uh, we'll look ahead because there's some snow in the forecast when I come back. Carolyn. Thanks, Ashley. A high school student in Corner Brook has made it her mission to be a better, more thoughtful digital citizen. She's tackling topics like cyber bullying and fake news, and she's using drama to do it. Here now is Colleen Connors tagged along for one of her presentations. Hi, I'm Mira Buckle and I'm at CC Lachlan and I'm doing a digital citizenship presentation. Oh, I'm going camping this weekend with the family. I don't think there's any cell service where we're staying either. Well, we're teaching students about how to become a positive yeah. digital citizen. And a digital citizen or a digital citizenship means the way of like acting um, online in a safe manner, um, being safe with like who you're talking to and, and um, the information you're putting out there and talking to people in like a respectful way online. Well, in the skits, we try to come up with a main message, and the theme relates to being a good, positive digital citizen. Um, I think that theater is as close as you can get to a real life experience, so that the students watching this play, they can really relate to it, and hopefully um, when they encounter an, um, a situation like this, they know how to handle it. This is the one that's photoshopped. All this here is just simply out and on, but it was pretty hard to tell, right? Okay, next up, Maria. We usually always believe what we read or see, but hopefully after what we showed you today, you'll be able to weed out the real from the fake. Um, if you see something that seems a little bit suspicious, just take a second and think, is it logical? Did I see this on another news site? And always a second opinion from a friend or family member can help. The kids as young as like grade four or grade three are getting cell phones. So I started thinking like if I was in grade four and I got a cell phone, I would probably encounter a lot of issues, not only just cyberbullying, like what about cybersecurity and like fake news and all that kind of stuff. So I thought that there should be a presentation in schools around being a digital citizen, which includes all of that and shows like students, you know, how to act safely and responsibly online. Um, I'm learning that a lot of them are like playing video games that even like grade 10, 11s are playing. So it's, it's crazy to think that they're um, already at the same level as kind of we are with that kind of stuff. Like I never got social media until I was in grade 8, 9, whereas some people are getting it as young as grade 4. Um, if you're like safe with it, then that's, that totally suits that age group. But, you know, you got to learn how to be safe and responsible with it. Um, it's great to hear back for them about, like, video games and stuff that they're encountering as youth because it really shows that, like, cyberbullying and cybersecurity and all that stuff is a relevant issue at grade four age. Thank you so much for coming to watch our play, and we really hope you learned a thing or two. You're all amazing people, and we know together we can become better people online and offline. Thank you. She's very impressive. And what a great idea to have students put this together and present it to the fellow students rather than having the teacher the up there adults, like, you know, I totally get yeah. this newfangled Snapchat and <laughs> Friendster that you're all going on about. <laughs> Definitely, I'm sure it would have more of an impact on the younger students to hear yeah, from yeah, more their authentic. peers. Yeah, exactly. Very cool. Canada's top civil servant, the clerk of the Privy Council, testified before the Commons Justice Committee today. And while he was there to talk about the SNC-Lavalin controversy, he also expressed concern about Canada's political climate. I worry about the rising tide of incitements to violence when people use terms like treason and traitor in open discourse. Those are the words that lead to assassination. I'm worried that somebody's going to be shot in this country this year during the political campaign. 
He denied that the PMO pressured former Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould to avoid putting the Montreal firm through a criminal trial on corruption and bribery charges related to government contracts in Libya. Those allegations surfaced in a Globe and Mail story two weeks ago. Wernick called the article defamatory and he said the call on SNC-Lavalin was strictly up to Wilson-Raybould. The minister made it clear that this was the decision for the Minister of Justice to take. She was the decision maker. Wilson Raybould is scheduled to address the Justice Committee next week, but it's not clear how much she'll be allowed to say. She's argued her discussions on the matter are covered under solicitor client privilege. Hundreds of people, including the Prime Minister, attended a candlelight vigil in Halifax last night to share their sympathy with the Barho family. The Syrian couple lost all seven of their children in a devastating house fire earlier this week. The Barhos came to Canada just over a year ago with the hopes of a better life. And the loss is perhaps most acutely felt in Elmsdale, the small community they called home until just a few months ago. Brett Ruskin reports. A very much loved family here. For the Barho family, Elmsdale, Nova Scotia was their first refuge in Canada. It's a quiet, tight-knit community. They met Danielle Chasson when they walked into the convenience store where she works and they quickly became friends. What they came from to have, to fight for, and I just don't understand why all seven lives and, and what they're left with. The town's sadness is now on full display. I have four of my own children. I could not imagine losing all seven children. The family's new life in Canada was cut short here. Last summer, they moved from Elmsdale to this home in Halifax to be closer to the larger Syrian community. It was an inferno, claiming the lives of all seven of the family's children. The father has serious burns and is now in a medically induced coma. The mother has few physical injuries, but has been calling out the names of her children from her hospital bed. I know everyone's mourning. It's seven beautiful, authentic souls, really. Um, as a mother spending time with that family, it's taught me a great deal about myself and my own parenting, parenting ways, because they were extremely close-knit, well-respected children that helped each other. It's a little different in our culture where we aren't so much like that. So it was very beautiful to see and be around, and which made me want to do better that way. She's left with questions just like everyone else. Where did the fire start? How did it spread? Why couldn't the kids get out? All part of an investigation that continued today. What she does have, though, is a new outlook in the aftermath of this heartbreak. Don't take your life for granted. Hug your children tighter. Say your story. Do your best. Because if anything I've learned through them is family is unity. It is everything. It's, that's one thing they had right. That's one thing they will carry on with me. Brett Ruskin, CBC News, Halifax.
Well, it's been decades since victims first came forward to detail the abuse at the hands of priests in this province, but there are still victims fighting to get compensation out of the Catholic Church. Bishops are meeting in Rome to discuss how the church should handle cases of sexual abuse. They were summoned there by the Pope. After 30 years of representing victims of abuse, St. John's lawyer Gregory Stack has a few ideas of what needs to happen. Why are there still so many cases of working their way through the courts of abuse? Well, it's natural that all victims don't come forward at the same time. It's a process of dealing with it internally. And uh, so different people can accept uh, that it happened at various stages of their life. They might be in their 20s and, and immediately report it. They might be teenagers and report it right away and in case there were cases like that and they weren't believed. Um, so sometimes in their 30s, 40s, even in their 50s, they come forward and say, look, this happened to me then. I've repressed this through my life or whatever, but I can no longer live with it. I want it out in the open. I want to deal with it and uh, so on. So that's why they come forward at different times. As terms of settling them is a more protracted process and we've had cases that have gone on in excess of 20 years and uh, the church does not settle these willingly. It wants to fight them, it engages lawyers, it puts the victims through the ringer and uh, so there's all these factors at work, both the timing of the victims coming forward and then the legal process and the church's I suppose decision to delay and to fight and to not honor these victims in any way. We know so much about the abuse that occurred at Mount Cashel and within the churches there's been inquiries, there's been recommendations. Why is the church continuing to fight settling these cases? I guess it just comes down to power and money and the longer they can put it off they figure the better I suppose for their own coffers. Uh, they drag it through, they hope that it just gets buried in the dust eventually and people go tired of hearing about it and dealing with it and so on. With the meetings happening in Rome, what would you like to see the Catholic Church actually do to address these issues? Well, the church is having the meetings, yes, but they're trying to only look at protecting themselves as they go forward and not addressing the harm that's occurred. That's my understanding of it. I'm not involved with it, but it's not addressing any of what has happened. And unless they address what has happened and look for the underlying causes of it, and it may mean making dogmatic changes in the church. It may mean introducing women that can become clergy. It may mean that priests can marry and have those type of socially more acceptable relationships and so on. They're supposed to be celibate, which means no sexuality at all. That seems unrealistic. And psychologists would say that's, that's bound to result in trouble. So these are fundamental tenets of the Catholic Church. If it's not going to change those, then they can have all this, the meetings they want and the, and the congregations getting together of different priests and so on and bishops to discuss these type of activities and what they can do to prevent them. But it's systemic changes that have to occur to prevent it from going on. Now, I also talked to the Archbishop, Peter Hunt, this afternoon, and he says the church has provided counseling and other pastoral services to victims and their family members for more than 20 years. He says when it comes to settling the legal cases, they would like to, but it can take time.
Welcome back to Here and Now. We're just minutes away from the first basketball World Cup qualifier ever to be played in Newfoundland and Labrador. Yes, and uh, Here Now's Mark Quinn is live at mile one. So, Mark, what's happening there now? Well, I just spoke to the organizers. They're expecting about 3,000 people to be here tonight. I have to say the smell of French fries is kind of getting to me and the crew here. But uh, we spoke with the uh, Canadian team earlier in the show, and we heard about uh, what they expect. I also spoke with one of the Chilean players. I spoke with Sebastian Suarez, and here's what he had to say about his very first visit to Newfoundland and Labrador. What did you think when you first found out you were coming to Newfoundland? Uh, I, I didn't know much about Canada. Uh, I've been to Vancouver. I've been to Vancouver, but I don't know anything about Canada. Uh, I did college in, uh, in the States, so it's Canada and the States for me is, is pretty much uh, very similar. So excited to be here, excited to be so far from, from home. And what do you think of uh, St. John's and Newfoundland? It's very, very cold. I think yesterday was one of the coldest day, days in like 20 years. So I don't know, it's, it's something new for me. Do you think this is going to affect uh, the team's play here in uh, Canada? No, no, absolutely. You, I, I think, I think um, you guys have everything with, uh, I mean, you, you, don't feel cold, you don't feel cold in here. I mean, with the hitters and everything, I don't think the cold is going to affect the game or nothing like that. No excuses. Have you played Canada before? Yeah, we played Canada like two months ago back in Chile. And what was the result? Uh, we lost by like 20, 30 or something like that. So what do you expect to happen tonight? Do you think you can win? Uh, I, I got to be honest. I mean, Canada is a few steps above Chile in basketball, more than a few. Uh, you guys have uh, a lot of NBA players, not, not here tonight, but you guys have a pretty good basketball team. Uh, Chile is, is, is new. It's new in basketball. It's, it's a coming up team. So uh, we just need to have a, a, a nice game, a good game with no mistakes so we can probably fight to the last quarter. Okay. And will you be qualifying, do you think, for the uh, World Cup? I think we have no chance, um, but we still got to play. So we, as a team, we are excited to, to play Canada, to, to, to take the challenge and, and, and play against players like, like Canada players that are playing in Europe, all over Europe and stuff like that. So we're just excited to be here. Great, so we're just minutes away from the start of the game and of course we're playing against Chile tonight, Canada versus Chile, and on Sunday Canada is taking on Venezuela. That's expected to be a tougher game. Uh, Canada has already qualified for the World Cup, so the outcome of these games uh, it will be important in terms of seeding, but they're definitely going to the World Cup in China this coming summer. Live in St. John's, I'm Mark Quinn for Here and Now.
This weather update is brought to you by Beltone, helping the world hear better. Oh, we've seen this a number of times. Let's see if it actually works. Temperatures outside about minus 14 right now. So it kind of worked and what's actually happening is the fact that the boiling water is pretty close to evaporating already. The temperature outside is much cooler. So when I throw the water up into the air, it actually vaporizes quite quickly. It attaches, those water vapor molecules attach to the condensation nuclei in the atmosphere, which is simply a little particles. They condense onto that and then fall as uh, ice crystals and that's all happening very quickly which is why it looks like snow <laughs> condensation nuclei wait wait I, I have a more important question here is this why there wasn't any hot water for my tea this afternoon yes it was i took the i took it <laughs> but yeah condensation nuclei it's just little little particles in the atmosphere but it's sciencey. Yeah, you know, <laughs> learn something fun. new every day. Yeah. yeah, didn't quite work, but it was worth the try. No, nope, not cold enough, but hey, it looked cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what's the forecast looking like? Are we going to have more condensation nuclei type uh, temperatures in the forecast? <laughs> well, we're gonna. We're, it's it's Thursday, which you may not know this, but it's Weather Whiz Kid Day. So we're gonna do that okay. first, and then we're gonna Ooh. talk about the forecast. Uh, our newest member is Anna Walsh. So she is. Uh, Draw, drew us this beautiful picture. She's oh, from grade four. Yeah, in St. John's, here Great in St. John's. Great job, four years old. No, nope, grade four. Grade oh, grade four. Four. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> oh, and there she excellent. is there. Yeah, so she sent us that great uh, drawing. And we love seeing them. If you want to send yours and you want to be part of the Weather Whiz Kid Club, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Your drawing, how old you are, uh, your address, so that I can send you that membership postcard in the mail. There you go. Mm -hmm. Nice. Now so, we're going to look ahead. <laughs> okay. Do the weekend because we're this close. Yeah. And everybody just wants to hear what and when are we going to see these temperatures uh, get better. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, the, news, the good news is it'll be towards the weekend. So, or rather towards the beginning of next week. Through Saturday, not a whole lot happening. Again, it looks like a beautiful afternoon for the majority of the province. We're looking at uh, a mix of sun and cloud through the afternoon. And those temperatures will finally start to feel a lot better um, as far as those winds go, but uh, going to sit still in the minus teens. Along the south coast, though, uh, going to be a little bit warmer. Minus 8 for Port of Bass, same for Marystown with that mix of sun and cloud as well. Some potential for some onshore flurries again for the west coast, and that's just because we're sticking with that northwesterly flow. Otherwise, plenty of sunshine up through Labrador and uh, minus 17 for Lab City. Similar temperatures right across the board. Now, looking ahead for Sunday, it looks another beautiful weekend uh, for the most part. As we head towards Monday, then we start to see the next system roll in. That cloud cover will move in overnight into Monday afternoon, and then we'll start to see that snow. With this, it's looking like maybe 10 to 15 centimeters of snow in some cases. That's still very early. We still have a couple of days uh, to look into that, but that's what the, the models are pointing at right now. And we'll see that continue generally into the afternoon on Tuesday as that low pulls away and we start to see that cooler air uh, wrap around it. Even though temperatures aren't going to be going up above zero, or they'll generally be hovering around the zero degree mark. So uh, taking a look at the forecast for the next five days, St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland, there's the, the potential for a few flurries tomorrow afternoon, again, minus nine, and then uh, staying chilly through the weekend, minus 13 is your afternoon high on Saturday, and then we get those warmer temperatures. So eventually by Tuesday, we'll see a high near zero degrees, but those winds will really pick up again on Monday as that system rolls in. Same thing for uh, central Newfoundland as we see that sunshine right through Sunday and then flurries and snow moving in on Monday. Not quite as warm though, going to stay in the minus single digits. And then for the west coast, uh, again, potential for some squalls right through Saturday. Generally a mix of sun and cloud though. And then same thing on Sunday at minus 10. 
with that snow and wind moving in on Monday and temperatures again uh, staying a little bit more cold. So it's still a, a little bit below seasonal for this time of year. Eastern uh, Labrador going to see plenty of sunshine right through the weekend. So I sound like a broken record as far as that's concerned. But uh, Monday and Tuesday is when those flurries will move in. Won't uh, see quite as much as uh, Newfoundland will and then Western Labrador. Same thing with snow moving in on Sunday late day and then continuing through the day on Tuesday. So just before we leave you, I wanted to share uh, your weather photo for today. Now this one isn't going to be that easy to decide where it is because it's been cold across the entire province, but that's a sun dog there. And uh, I'll tell you where it was taken when we come back. Welcome back to Here and Now. So, time out to have a look at your uh, photo, your weather photo of the day. This is a nice one. Yeah, we uh, mentioned just before the break that this was a sun dog. And just in case you don't know what a sun dog is, it is technically a halo. And uh, it is essentially the light or the sun refla refracting off of the ice crystals that are sitting in the atmosphere. Ah, oh. so it's cold enough that you've got ice crystals in the Absolutely. air. Absolutely. The sun refracts off them and that's where you get those little rainbows. That's nice. right. There you and go. this time we saw one in Cornerbrook. There you go. Mm -hmm. I'm so also familiar with the Sun Dogs in Maine, a uh, popular local band up there. Ah, that's right. Probably less of a halo around them, but <laughs> <laughs> they still do a very nice job. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting phenomenon. I saw this a lot of times uh, up north, which was beautiful. And then you get your like light pillars and oh, beautiful. But yeah, it was a cold that. day, a beautiful sun dog in Cornerbrook. Thank you so much for Nancy, to Nancy Janes for sending that photo in. If you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Great. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's always so nice to see when people send in, you know, the beautiful spots in their parts of the province, especially when you get a day like today in St. John's where you get that beautiful sunshine, blue sky, cold, crisp temperatures. Yeah. I actually enjoyed it, which, but maybe that's the time I spent in Labrador talking. <laughs> yeah, you, you were used to the cold up there for and I've sure. Got, and I've got the park, you know, that still <laughs> keeps me warm. So. All of our complaining about the cold, everyone in Labrador is rolling their eyes because yeah. <laughs> they get so much This is fun. a warm day for them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But these uh, cooler temperatures have also, we're seeing a lot of ice pack too, so I'm seeing lots of photos of people giving us ice pictures. Okay. There you go. Mm, More yeah. pictures, please. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much everyone for joining us tonight. Have a good night. Good night.